seconds. Let's start. And then, thank you very much. And then we begin with the backup recorder. We're good? We're good? Okay, good morning. Kahal Kadosh. Beruchim Abayim to everybody today, Wednesday, the 11th day of Sivan, corresponding to the first. Today is the first? Oh, 31st. Today is the 31st of uh, May 2023. Today's class, graciously sponsored by Ricardo Jamal, the Ayui Nishmati's beloved father, Jamil Ben Nizha, Halava Shalom. Additionally, by the Alfasi and Warman family, the Ayui Nishmat, the beloved father, Leon Ben Rahel, Halava Shalom. Additionally, today's class, graciously sponsored by Jimmy Levy, the Ayui Nishmati's beloved mother, Esther Batiafa, Alea Shalom, that today is the day of her Yorzai, as well as Mal Cohen and family, Le'ayui Nishmat, his beloved father, Obadiah ben Emeleke, or Obadiah ben Malka, that today also is the day of his Yorzai, and also Le'ayui Nishmat, his beloved mother, Hava Yvette Bat Jamile, that we are within the year of her passing. Additionally, today's class, graciously sponsored by Yaakov Cohen and family for the Refua Shirema of Michel Lazimi, Meir Ben Zohara, as well as the Refua Shirema, Esther Batrif Kafani, among the Holim of Am Israel. So today, before we start the class, uh, I have a little uh, biography on Mr. Eddie Cohen, or Edward Cohen, or Obadiah Ben Meleke. And uh, one of the reasons why I'm going to share with the Kahal uh, some of his historical aspects of life is because I see in his life many of our lives. How people began from humble beginnings, becoming immigrant, immigrants in a foreign land, and surviving the spiritual challenges. This is not about the financial success, which is always beautiful to hear and to talk about it, but is about how a person is protected by a Kadosh Baruch Hu, even in the most challenging and situations of life, which some of them are related to a physical danger, and many of them are related to a Ruhani danger, to a spiritual uh, danger, besides the fact uh, that I remember him vividly from the early days of the Safra Synagogue here, as well as his late wife, Aliyah HaShalom. So, I'm going to give you some basic guidelines. I mean, uh, born in the year 1915, actually born in the USA, all right? So we skip the traveling, but the parents did come from far earlier, much earlier, and regretfully, at the age of uh, six years old, his father uh, suffered a stroke mm -hmm. and suddenly a child of six years old needs to become the caretaker of his family. Now, let this sink and digest in your mind. Very difficult. Very difficult. And uh, not only that, basically it was him and his four sisters. So let this digest in your brain. And obviously, uh, sometimes uh, challenges is what motivates a person to excel and exceed in life. And that's in a way what he did. From selling uh, newspapers, ice creams, you know, all kinds of uh, oh, chicles, whatever, right? Remember that? I remember that as a child. Uh, but. Three years later, his father uh, passed away, and nevertheless, he continued with his great emuna in Akadosh Baruch Hu. He became a store owner at the age of 16 back then. So do the numbers, 1915 plus 16, 1931. Some of us were not even part of this world yet. Later on, he joined the US Armed Forces like many, many members of the community did back then in the day. We remember when it comes to the yard side of uh, Mickey Carey, 
Alaba Shalom. Everybody remembers him fondly and how many stories we had mentioned about his life and the pride that he displayed as a Jew. Today you say the word pride, you got to think twice. What are you referring to? Okay, but for centuries, right? I know it's funny what I just said, but it's the reality of life. In centuries, when we spoke about the pride of being a Jew, that's all it meant. You didn't need the, the translation of what exactly are you referring to. And how many times he got into trouble just for defending Jewish people when anti-Semitism was exposed and elevated uh, regretfully, especially during the time of the Second uh, War. And basically, he, after a few years in the army, he came back and he started to work again. But obviously, there was the recession and many other challenges, especially being out of the world picture in the world of business. So here is the part that intrigues me the most because as I said in the past, I relate to the following chapter of his life. And it says that uh, in 1958, basically his business collapsed and he tried to activate what the Gemara says. Sometimes when you see that certain things or a person living in a certain city doesn't seem to be flourishing, there is advice not to cause yourself pain and suffering and to struggle. Sometimes you gotta be intelligent enough to say, you know what? Maybe I need to do what the Gemara says. What the Gemara says, change location. Maybe you stop in the mazal of this particular city and maybe the mazal will smile for you elsewhere. And that's the reason why, when God forbid, someone experiences a very dangerous medical situation, exactly, one of the things that is done, the Gemara writes, change the name. Give the person a new identity. Why? Because maybe the decree approved was related only to this person. But now this person that has a new name is like a witness protection program. Correct? You're familiar with that? Yes. You're not part of it, right? No. Baruch Hashem. <laughs> Otherwise, your cover will be, you know, exposed. exposed. Right, exposed. Has Shalom. But can you imagine you get a brand new identity? That's what the Gemara says. And if you look at the prayer that we make when somebody has a change of name, it says, if a decree may have been given, let's say a fictitious name, about Abraham ben Sarah, but there is no decree about Haim Abraham ben Sarah. Yeah. It's a new name. So the Gemara says clearly that there are three tactics that a person should activate. One is called moving. She knew my call. She knew my call. She knew my That's it. Even if you have merchandise in a business and you see that the merchandise is not really moving, you know what you should do? You Move it. Relocate it. Put it in a discount. Put it in the front. Why? Maybe the mazal got stuck there and now you need to reactivate the mazal. People tried it and it works. So then you have She knew my call. Change location. She knew your shim. Change your name. Change your actions. Now, um, interesting enough, before I go to the next part of the story, when a business collapses, there are many uh, ways that how do you end up with your business. Sometimes people activate the laws of bankruptcy and the loss of bankruptcy, depending on the chapter, right? Chapter 7, 11, 13, there are many different chapters, and each one provides a different level of protection. And in some cases, you don't pay. But in the case of Abadia ben Meleke, completely the opposite. Even though his business collapsed, he worked very, very hard to pay every one of the people that he owed money to which that alone, it's very special to speak about it. Usually, many times, 
people say, oh, I filed for bankruptcy, I'm gonna have to pay you money back. It happened to me, here. It happened to me many years back. We approached someone, listen, there is an invoice with the shoes. No, I, 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 I filed for bankruptcy. I'm gonna have to pay you back. I said, okay, go to sleep at night with your neshama. You know, I'm still waiting, but that's a different story. Yeah. And I remember that we got the court paper saying, Forgive and forget. Right, forget. Okay, kapara. It happens, okay? But in this case, was completely the opposite. One of, he, one of his biggest uh, mitot that he had was honesty, which is something that the Gemara praises in Masechet Shabbat, that the first question we ask, no we, the Gemara says that a person is asked was, Nasata benatata be'emuna, how honest were you in the world of business? And no one can answer that question with the exception of the person themselves. The Pasuk writes, Yodea sadik nefesh behemto, the righteous knows what's in their heart. Only the person can say. And this is something that not only this was the cornerstone of his life, but this was something, the seed that he planted in the life of his family uh, as well. Mickey Tyler, right? We're talking about? No, we're talking about Mr. Obadia Ben Meleke, Mr. Eddie Cohen, Edward Cohen. We continue. Uh, the family lived in New Orleans. Now, if New Orleans today, it's known South. has a the South in Louisiana, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. a, not a large, not, not a community, to be honest with you. A very tiny community. And we also know that, you know, I'm not sure how many Jewish people are there. Maybe. But imagine if this is what I'm saying today in the year 2023, go back to 1950, 1960s. Probably there were a handful of Jewish people. Most likely there was no Ketab, there was no Yeshiva, there was no Talmud Torah, there was nothing. What was there? Public school and going. So I remember Abdil Mal told me the story many years back that what was the straw that broke the camel's back? Because financially they became stabilized. But the fear of assimilation started to crawl into their home. How come? When a classmate, Goy or Goya, came to their home to do homework. And once that bridge is crossed, then you're looking for trouble. Remember yesterday, no, you were not here yesterday or the day before, because I, I give the class in the morning after the nets. And the halachot that we are learning now is the loss of bishula akum, the loss of food cooked by goyim, or bread baked by goyim. That there are certain parameters in the halacha, what's allowed, what's not allowed. It's a known halachot. But one of the very clear reasons why the halacha says avoid breaking bread with Gentiles, avoid eating food from Gentiles, is basically to avoid assimilation. That's all it is. Bottom line. Bottom line. Mishum hitnut. That's it. Because the moment that you gonna start mingling and you go to the home to pick up the bread, wait, the bread is not ready. You bring your child. Oh, I have a child. Bring your child. Let's play. Hazakobaru. This is the opening that the Yeserara needs. And he says it's only bread. You need to eat bread. True, we need to eat bread. But not when you have to go to the house of the Goy and pick it up, bake in their home. Commercially, bread manufactured bread, the Alaha is more lenient. Why? Because, again, it's a commercially manufactured type of bread. Doesn't have all the halachic requirements, obviously. It's not part Israel. There was no Jew involved in the baking of bread. For sure it's not Yashan. For sure they don't sift the flour. But there are leniencies to rely upon this because it's commercially produced and 
you don't mingle, you don't interact, you just go to the grocery store, make sure that it has ashgaha, and you need to know this. When you buy bread, it's not the topic of today, but you need to know. When you buy bread from a regular supermarket and you see the OU, the only thing the OU tells you is that the ingredients are kosher, no more than that. They are not yashan, unless it's a Jewish bakery from Brooklyn, New Jersey, etc. It's not Pat Israel, unless it's a Jewish owned bakery or a Jew was involved in the manufacturing of the baking of the bread, it's kosher ingredients. You eat it or not, I personally don't eat it. I only buy from kosher bakeries. Or you, you don't buy? I don't buy. Because yes. I like to have yashan. Yashan, yashan. Oh, just the because bread. Of the bread. I'm talking about the, the bread. Only I'm talking about the bread. Other stuff, for sure, not a problem. But as far as concerned, the bread, you know, I try to have Pat Israel and Kemah Yashan, especially when it applies. Also, from a Kabbalistic perspective, I remember reading this many years ago, that sometimes people ask why the Kashrut is not influencing the person. And the, why Kashrut, we learned yesterday that Kashrut influences the person in a good way. But sometimes you see that Kashrut, the person eats kosher and it's not influencing the person. How could it be? So question number one is, do they eat kasher in the house and outside of the home? Or only inside of the home? Mm -hmm. You understand? Sometimes people say, at home I eat only kosher. So when somebody tells me, at home I eat only kosher, what do I understand? That outside of the home, you don't. So what happens if your body mixes kosher food and non-kosher food? You get a short circuit of the neshama. The neshama is confused. Or sometimes, so that's what's written in the holy books, that a person eats kasher when really it's not kasher. And that's why today is very uh, popular to see, for example, supervisions which are approved and which are not approved. What does it mean approved and not approved? Very simple. The JSOR that is doing marvelous job for the Sephardic world in America, uh, in activating the kashrut's requirement of the Sephardic community. You need to know a few facts, that the requirements of the Sephardic community in kashrut are much stricter than the Ashkenazic community. And this is not, God forbid, to minimize. You just need to know the fact. The fact is that Sephardim in kashrut are more strict than Ashkenazim in certain areas. Like in Pesach, Sephardim are more lenient, Ashkenazim are more strict, Kashrut throughout the year, Sephardim are more demanding than Ashkenazim. We also do Selichot, 40 days, they do Selichot, three to seven days, whatever. So it depends on the tradition. And God forbid, Elu ve Elu divre Elohim Haim. The Gemara writes that both ways are okay. Especially just a person just need to follow one way. Don't wishy wash. The Gemara writes, follow all the strict views, it's wrong. Following all the leniencies, it's wrong. You need to follow the middle of the road. Sometimes Sephardi is more strict, sometimes Sephardi is more lenient, it doesn't matter. Just follow one way. Don't create confusion in your life. So basically, one second, please. So basically, in the early 70s, the wife, and this goes back to the power of the Jewish mother, the power of the Jewish uh, wives, that basically, uh, to protect the family, moving back to Brooklyn, it's required. I personally relate to this paragraph, and that's one of the reasons why I'm saying this, because I told you the story a few months ago, my grandmother, we experienced something very similar. When my family, my grandparents came from Halab, first came to Buenos Aires, then they moved to Bahia Blanca, a province 300 miles from Buenos Aires. No community, very minimal, Minyanim at home, Shabbat only, kosher food needed to come from Buenos Aires, and obviously there was no school available for the boys or the girls. So they all went to the Christian school. 
That was the only school available in the in the parochia, how they call it, in the city, in the town, in the whatever, county. whatever. That's that's what they had. And when my grandmother st started to smell like anti-Semitism and and friendships that were not suitable for they expected, she told my father, my, my grandfather, Alava Shalom, uh, school is over. I'm going home. back to Buenos Aires. Okay, but what about the business? What about, I don't care. Sell the business, get rid of the business, give the give business a gift, I'm moving. And Baruch Hashem, my grandfather, listened to my grandmother, Alea Shalom, and they moved back to uh, Buenos Aires, where the, the bulk of the community was there. And Baruch Hashem, every single one who left that part of the province, their children married Jewish and Jewish descendants. Regretfully, those that stayed behind, there is no memory of them today. Yeah, there is a memory somewhere. A Holocaust. It's, it's silent, what? it's called the silent Holocaust. The silent Holocaust. It's called assimilation. That's what it is. That's what it is. The silent Holocaust is equal to, and I'm, I'm, and I'm very uncomfortable even to call it the Holocaust, because usually the Holocaust is related to a certain level of tragedy. But I'm gonna say something that may be even crazier. It's more dangerous the silent Holocaust than the loud Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Because you don't see it, that is cracking in, that is coming in, that is penetrating, creeps into quietly. And by the time you wake up, you got to deal with a, with a condition. So Baruch Hashem, uh, making the right decisions at the right time, Borei Olam definitely takes care of uh, the person's neshama. And, and again, you don't see the results when that happens. Because when that needs to happen, you start thinking, but I'm going to move, I have to buy a house, I have to rent a house, I have my business, I'm going to come in call. But guess what? When a person is Moser Nefesh, and this is a lesson, and that's the reason why I spoke about this, because even though it's not class from the book, as we learned yesterday, you know, somebody, I got many good comments that people were thankful that we spoke about the topic of the great Hacham Edelstein, Shalom, that obviously the Jewish world is in shock about this unexpected uh, and I say unexpected even though he was a hundred years old, but as I said, that very same day that he passed away, I saw the written notes yesterday night. Somebody from Israel sent me a copy of the notes that he was dictating the notes to the student while he was in the hospital. Can you imagine? You gave a shiur the day before, you're writing the notes, so they do the transcripts of the shiur, in the audience in the hospital, obviously there were not too many people. There were a handful of people. And there, there are two students, two Talmidei Hachamim, that they are called the, 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 the recorders of the rabbi. They have such a memory that they record and memorize everything that the rabbi said. And then they put it into a transcript, and then he will review it, write his comments, and then share it with the students of the yeshiva. I mean, we cannot understand the level of greatness that a certain Talmidei Hachamim have in the world. But you know, Shalom, David Amelech, I believe it says, uh, I think it's attributed to David, but if not to one of the great sages of Am Israel, that it says, I learn from my teachers. I learn from my friends. But from my students, I learned the most. In other words, tell me that, you tell me kulam. You ask questions, I don't know the answer, I need to do research. Now I know the answer, so you help me to know better. So when we speak about people that we can relate to, meaning to say, we're not talking about stories of 500 years ago. We're talking about stories of 30, 40 years ago that most of us were alive in 1960, not me, I was much later, but the 70s, we were alive. So we said, oh, 1970s, of course. I remember I was first grade in 1970. 
Uh, no, actually, yeah, pre one a, pre one a, okay. And I remember, I remember growing up with the stories of my grandparents, which I never knew, by the way. They passed away when I was a baby. Yeah. One when I was three, two years old, the other one when I was four years old, maybe. But I only remember them through the pictures and through the stories. That they gave everything up to Avodat Hashem. Yeah. And they were not religious, let's clarify. Back then, what did it mean to be religious? Put on talet, tefillin, go to the knees on Shabbat, eat kasher, mikveh, hopefully, that's what it was. But, in the simplicity, or in the apparent simplicity of a Jew, there is something called temimut. Simplicity. What does it mean? You don't know Gemara. You don't learn Mishnah like today. Today, Torah, as I said to somebody the other night, in the history of the Jewish world, there was no much Torah exposed and accessible like today. Even in the time of the Mishnah, in the Gemara, that there were giants, the exposure to Torah was limited. First was in memory, and then they had to start writing because people were forgetting. You think there are books that like we have today? You go to the bookstore, you want to buy a Sidur, you spend half an hour to decide which Sidur to buy. Options. Of course not, and not in Egypt. Back then, one book for the whole class. One book for the whole class. But today, you know, we have it. But this temimut, this simplicity of the older generation and the previous generations is really what kept the Jewish people alive. Tamim. I know what I need to do. I know doing this is right, doing that is not right. I'll do what I can. And guess what? Akadosh Baruch Hu doesn't use the same parameter of judgment to every person and in every generation. The Noam Elimelech, Alaba Shalom, writes and it says that a person, or rather every generation, has its own sets of challenges. The challenges of 30 years ago are not the challenges of today. The challenges of 30 years from now are different than today. And each person that lives in the generation where they live at, that's their mission. Today, I bring a few examples. To eat kasher is not complicated. Today, easy. Easy. 40 years back, 30 years back, forget about it. I was telling members of the Net Minyan yesterday that I remember as a child, seven, eight years old, Sunday morning, just to understand how the system works in the 70s, okay? Sunday morning, what was our mission? Our mission was go to the Knis, go to the synagogue between 10 and 12. Back then, I don't think we had school on Sunday. Later on, high school, neither. neither. Only half day Hebrew school. That's it. Actually, no, Ketab, an hour and a half. And if you come, you get a, a gift. If you don't come, you don't get it. But for you to get a gift on Sunday, you needed to come Shabbat afternoon to the Zemirot class. Mm -hmm. Of course, incentives. Yeah, incentives. incentives. I remember that vividly. So believe me, everybody woke up early on Sunday because we wanted to get the gift. Okay. And the gift was a brand new uh, 50 pesos, maybe a dollar and a half. Yeah, I mean, a gift, you know. And once every three months, if we have perfect attendance, 
you qualify for a Sunday trip. Very nice. Very nice. Anyways, so I remember. Rabbi, you value those minutes? Those <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Well, you're doing it now with the, the trips. Hazako Baru. Yeah. Hazako Baru. So what was our mission on Sundays? Go to the synagogue. Listen to this. Come up with a container to pick up your kosher milk. Because back then, there was no trust that the milk sold by the Argentinian farms was kosher. We're going back in the 70s. Okay? And the Lacha writes, the Lacha is clear in the Shokan Aru. You know, right? It says, a Yehudi that did not see the milk, you cannot drink. That's what's written in the Lacha. They give you a mixture. Yeah. That's the reason why. So today you rely on the leniency that there is governmental supervision, USDA, etc. Okay? That's the difference between halal Israel and halal Akum. Milk supervised by a Jew. Today, Baruch Hashem, we have options. Brands, not issues. But back then, the only access to milk was coming to the synagogue, and many shuls used to have representatives that they will travel an hour or two, go pick up the milk from the farm, supervise it, and come to the synagogue, and you pick up your two, three liters container for the week. They used to pick it up, I remember that, run home, boil the milk yes. immediately, because it wasn't processed and pasteurized the way it is today. So you can imagine, five, seven years later, when they came out with long life kosher milk and uh, fresh kosher milk, till today, the excitement in the community. You understand? Mm -hmm. So these are things that as a child that I lived through them, you know, you say to yourself, we are spoiled today. We are super spoiled that we have it. And you know why? Because today eating kosher is not a challenge. Baruch Hashem is the merit of the Jewish people. But we have other challenges. At all levels. At all levels. If it's financial challenges today, or marital situations, or, or all the values that suddenly become corrupted and discussed uh, in a way that are unfortunate, uh, you've got to be careful even how you speak now. Because you may say words that has the shalom, you know, liable. More, more or less, I heard that uh, a crazy law, it happened yesterday, I think, that uh, in New York, uh, I think s some office of the government froze deposits of two banks, right, for not activating certain laws of protections to the all segments of the community. I didn't really understand. I just said to myself, you know, what is going on? Target removed all these uh, yeah, yeah. inappropriate things, yeah. and now they, they're fighting a war against Target. Yeah. I, but this is what's happening. The Gemara writes, Olama fuch ra'iti. I see a backward world. It's definitely time of Mashiach. It's no doubt that when you see so much decadence in the world, that a change needs to happen. And in a way, in a way, we can relate this idea to the topic of the uh, reading the book of Tehillim. Now, the book of Tehillim, I saw something so beautiful in Shavuot, that it says that a person who wants to increase their bitahon in a Kadosh Baruch Hu, and to activate power of blessings in the life that we all need it, should make sure to read a few chapters of the Hilim daily. I don't know how many people do this, but for centuries, the reading of the Hilim, it became something very dear to the Jewish people. Probably more. 
I'm not going to use the word centuries. I don't want to say for, you know, since the creation because it did not happen. It happened from David and Melech. But a few things I saw that it says Tehillim has 150 chapters. What is the magic in the number 150? It says that 150 is twice the word bitahon. Bitahon, 75 times 2, 150. Trust. Trust in Hashem. So it says a person that makes the effort of reading Tehillim daily gets a double dosage of bitahon. It's like you say, doesn't matter the chapters that you read, obviously. No, I'm not referring to Tikkun Aklali. No, that's a different concept. That's a tense, now, let me explain please. That's the Breslev idea of reading 10 chapters of Tehillim, uh, uh, of pe for Pegama Berit, for the Berit Milah. Has Shalom. There is nothing wrong to read the Tikkun Aklali, but that's not the only formula of how to read Tehillim. I personally read Tehillim the way the way is divided by the days of the month. So if you look at the book of Tehillim, the book of Tehillim is divided seven days, five weeks, five books, and 30 days. So each day corresponds to a few chapters. So today is the 11th of Sivan, for example. So you leave the, the, the chapters that belongs to the 11th day of the month. And by the way, every book of Tehillim has exactly what I'm saying. Just sometimes you see the fine print will say Yod Aleph Lecholesh. So obviously, Tikkun Aklali is wonderful. Thank you so much. We can read day by day. No, it's not three per day. Look, for example, here. I'm going to open up this chapter. Okay, so you have this mega-sized book of Tehillim that tells you on top of the page. Wait, wait, let me do, let me explain. The third day of the week, chapter 60, the 11th of the month. I do this one. The 11th day of the month every day. Today is 12, so today my reading of the I didn't do it yet. I'll do it soon. Begins from chapter 60. So the Hebrew calendar. Only Hebrew calendar through 65. Five chapters. If it's 30 days, and it's 150 chapters, five per day. Sometimes you may have four, sometimes you may have six, but it's not more than that. Shouldn't take more than five, seven minutes. Uh, to do it. There are people who finish the day of the week. So yeah. today is Wednesday, so you flip the page till you find Wednesday. You're going to have to do because that's already 30 chapters. Yeah. But if you do the day, that's what it says here, day. that if you do the daily Tehillim, you're activating blessings which are stuck, suspended, Suddenly, it's like you're adding WD-40, mm. and now the door opens and the Beracha comes down. And also, Tehillim is a multi-purpose type of vitamin. We do it in the Tefillah, in the prayers, yeah. from a uh, Mismor Letoda yeah. till by Baruch David, <laughs> all these things are from the book of Tehillim. That's one. The other one is at the end of the prayer. Hayom Yom Rebi'i. All the chapters of the weekdays, including Shabbat, they come from the book of Tehillim. But I'm not referring to that because you're doing that as prayer. The reading of Tehillim is extra. And you activate immediately the concept of Bitahon and Emunah in a Kadosh Baruch Hu. That's why somebody said many years ago, Tehillim, to heal, Tehillim, to heal him. That's why in any situation, somebody, to heal him, right? Anybody needs a miracle, you read Tehillim. You need Refuah, Tehillim. Somebody, God forbid, passes away, Tehillim. 
What, what do you need? What do you need? The Tehillim has it. And not only that, some books, I'm not sure if this one has it, but some chapters here, yeah, because this is young, done for children with a lot of large fonts, but many, many uh, books of Tehillim, in Hebrew or English, they tell you, okay, this chapter of Tehillim is suitable for this. This chapter of yeah. Tehillim yeah. is for this type of pain. This chapter of Tehillim is to see miracles. This chapter of Tehillim is to for Shalom Bayi. This chapter for Parnassah. In other words, the Tehillim, look at it, has a multi-purpose vitamin. But it says in the Shalom Melech Raira of Shira Shirim, the Pasuk says, Dovev Sifte Yeshenim, the murmuring of the lips of the sleepy ones. That means that when we say Tehillim, David Melech is saying Tehillim with us. That's what's written. Unbelievable. What, what about the small pamphlet that we have, like they come like 20 books? That's beautiful. That's good. Is, is that book every, uh, according to the way? No, the way, the way it's done, no, it's not done by the day. They took the Tehillim and they divided into 24 booklets, and then they have 24 people, and in five minutes, they finish the whole book of Tehillim. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't matter, the main idea so many, is... Read it like every day, can we do that? Sure, you can do it, you can do anything you want. No, what I could do, and what, what we should do is... No, no, day. again, this is suggestion. You're not obligated to do it, I know. but if you want to do it, take a book of Tehillim. The easiest formula is the formula I just gave you. Yeah. Okay. Open the book of Tehillim, day read day. the day of today. Today is the Hebrew day in the month, so you read the chapters that belong That's to right. day That's 11. Right. Tomorrow is 12, some days are longer, some days are shorter, but as you get used to read Tehillim, and not only that, I also saw in writing that says that every imaginable situation of life is found in the book of Tehillim. If you look for it, you'll find it. If you look for it, why? Because David Melech went through every imaginable situation. Shalom Bayit issues, Shalom Bayit found. Children issues, found. Livelihood issues, found. In those matters, found. Whatever you want, he found it. That's the power of the book of Tehillim. And it says that at the end of the, the, the book of Tehillim, I'll finish with this, David Amelech finishes and it says, Kol neshama hallelujah. Literally that verse means all the souls, all the neshama, will praise you. So David Amelech says, no. Don't say the neshama praises you, but al kol neshima, Uneshima. Neshima means to breathe. Neshama means the soul. David Amelech says, I'm able to breathe. I woke up today. I'm alive. It's enough reason for me to praise you. Wow. I have headaches, I have situations, but have. I'll deal with them later. The fact that I'm able to breathe, it's enough reason for me to express your gratitude to Akadosh eh, Baruch Hu. Okay. So here at Son, of course, here at Son, that the, all the Neshamot that we honor today by dedicating the class of Torah and the lessons that we learn in speaking about some of them and the lessons of David Melech really gives us the much essential bitahon that a person needs to overcome as we discussed in the past. Emunah is one level. Emunah means I have faith in Akadosh Baruch Hu. Bitahon literally means activating this faith that I have in Akadosh Baruch Hu. And the more Bitahon the person is able to acquire in life, the less we drown in a cup of water. Because what happens? The lack of Emunan Bitahon, God forbid, causes the person to drown. Not physically, God forbid, but drown. You will suddenly become overwhelmed with all matters. Through the reading of Tehillim, it's like IV. You know, you ever saw somebody, they do an IV infusion, whatever kind of infusion they do. What's the IV? The IV, if you look at it, doesn't go 
at a tremendous amount of speed. The opposite, sometimes you feel drop. nothing is going on. Drop by drop, drop by drop, drop by drop. You know where the IV came from? From Rabbi Akiva. The IV came from Rabbi Akiva. Where? When Rabbi Akiva was shepherd, shepherd, Shepherding, maybe I'm not sure that the word had to say it, but he was taking care of the sheep of Kalba Sabua and his shepherd, right? And he saw the drops of water slowly going into the rock. And after so many times that the water came down constantly, slowly, penetrated, penetrated into the rock. And Rabbi Akiva says, if the rock that is hard the water can penetrate, the slow. water which is the Torah for sure can penetrate my heart. Wow. That's the IV. What's the IV? Slow dripping, you know, and they monitor it. If uh, zero, zero point five every minute, you know, sometimes you see it that it's not moving. It's moving, you don't see it. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the words of the healing. Maybe the first day, second day, you don't see you don't feel, but as you accustom yourself for this suggested exercise of reading a few chapters of Tehillim a day, you can do it anytime. Some people do it before prayer, some people do it after prayer, but it's something that I saw in Shavuot that it says that Tehillim has so much power that if people will really understand how powerful will be Tehillim, they will say Tehillim all day long. And you have seen it. I remember when I was in Argentina, now, a few months ago, I walked into a grocery store. Grocery. Jewish? Kosher, kosher grocery. So next to the hotel, heading to the shul, I see a grocery store. Very interesting, because it doesn't open too early, but closes early. Okay, I don't ask questions, I'm a tourist. And uh, I come in, what do I hear? He's playing a class of Torah in Hebrew. Very nice. What the guy is doing behind the counter? Reading to him. And he asks every customer, you came into my store, listen to this. I don't care if you buy. But please read a chapter of the Hilim for the well-being of the Jewish people. That's requirement. Very strong. I came in with Stand my wife. Sat down and read it. And no, I was no. He, he, he built it like the Kaddish behind you. Yeah, That's the size of the Elim. Shila Ma'alot, Esai, Nei, Le'arim. Yemeh, is the one chapter. That's it. That's it. See, easy chapter. And then I felt bad. I was so inspired that I bought. <laughs> sure. Maybe I bought a few things. It's a trick. <laughs> what? <laughs> Huh? <laughs> Maybe it's a trick. Yeah. No, 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 no. He said, you don't have to buy anything. Whatever, whatever I'm going to make, a, 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 a very a simple fellow. What's the meaning of a simple fellow? A good Jew. No, learned, yeshiva, hasir. No, nice Syrian fellow who reads the Hilim, does what he needs to do, and does that as a way of life. Sometimes you hear of these stories, but until you come across these things, you don't really understand what does it mean. And again, this breakfast room is bigger than his grocery store. So imagine how tiny the grocery store is. Maybe half of this size. With shelves and bread and deli and stuff. Small, in and out, in and out, nothing fancy. But a content, unbelievable experience, unbelievable experience. Okay, my good friends. Baruch Adonai Le'Olam. Amen. Be Amen. Rabbi Hanani Amen. Akashia Omer. If you're gonna go to Argentina, let me know, and I tell you where the grocery store is, so you can have the same experience that I had. Okay. Rabbi Hanani Amen. Akashia